Let's jam. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have one returning brother and three newcomers here in the temple. First off, we have the head of Drop Dead Studios and the ring and the ringmaster of this particular circus, um, Adam, better known as Adam Myers. And with me, we have three of the writers for the two projects we'll be talking about tonight. We have the three-headed monster that is Scowling Dragon, Squid Baron, and Horus, who keeps insisting that Lord of the Rings is a Christmas movie. It is. It has elves. Honestly, yeah. I can kind of see it. Um, I've been I've been trying to. I, it was um, really weird when he argued that Sauron was Santa Claus in it. Um, I just I've remember always... it came out every December for three years in a row, so it became a tradition, whether you liked it or not. Well, the tradition, the Christmas tradition for me is mar is marathoning a bunch of a bunch of old um, MST3K episodes. <laughs> Something that Comedy Central used to do on a yearly basis, even though they keep insisting they never did. <laughs> uh, either either that or um or or jumping on or the times that I've jumped on the Die Hard is a Christmas movie um bandwagon, mm -hmm. which it is. We'll be there too, man. Um, <laughs> I even made it a long time ago. I made a Nakatomi Plaza gingerbread house. And said I, I was supposed to make a Christmas themed gingerbread house, so I had to be a smart ass. Mm -hmm. Although, That's awesome. I am not I'm not skilled enough with gingerbread making to outdo the lady who did a gingerbread Optimus Prime. <laughs> like, Damn. I'm good, but I'm not that good. Oh. Did it transform? No. Oh. Sure, did it transform into a tasty snack? No, the only thing it's going to transform is in, is into is something in people's stomachs. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing. But I'd like to now. I've got I've gone into the humble beginnings the last time I had Ad, Adam here. But for for the rest of you, I'd like to go into the humble beginnings as I do with everybody who come who comes in for the first time. Well, I'd like to get your origin story when it comes to tabletop. So walk me through your introduction and how it stuck with you. Oh boy. This is going to go way back. I guess my first introduction was when I was in fourth grade, somebody brought a D&D &D th third edition player's handbook to, cl um, to class. And during reading period, I borrowed it. I looked through it. And years later, I ended up picking up several more books, which I didn't realize were actually scattered across three separate D&D &D editions and roughly tried to do an adventure with them. Over time, once I hit high school, I started actually figuring out how different systems worked. Um, and of course, me being the ambitious bastard that I am, I am me. Um, I after about six months, I thought, okay, I think I know w enough about this to actually start submitting stuff, and essentially just started throwing whatever I could out there to various publications. Um, eventually, some things stuck. I ended up getting um, some work with several publishers, right. and mm -hmm. yeah. well, here I am now. Mm -hmm. All right, I think that was. Um... Hi, Hydrons. I think you were, or Scowl, someone was uh, cutting out. We were trying to hear, but we couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh, I was able to get the gist of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I guess uh, I'll go next, unless mm -hmm. you have questions for him. Yep. Um, I got into RPGs, actually, for a very long time. I was kind of raised on stories from my dad. Because back in the day, he was really big into like AD and D. Back in the eighties, late mm -hmm. or early nineties, um, which is always interesting to hear his stories growing up. Although he had stopped playing a long time ago, 
Uh, sometime around middle school, though, I got a group of friends together. We were all interested in trying to play D&D. We originally started with 4th edition. That was mm, pretty yes. bleh. Um, and then a family friend of my family, uh, my dad's old friend from high school, actually introduced me to Pathfinder. Um, I tried that out, and this is back in like 2013 or so. And, oh, lost Galling. It's unfortunate. Technical oh. difficulties and all. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I got into Pathfinder back in like 2013. Uh, <laughs> ran that for my friends because he introduced me to it on like a family vacation because we were up visiting what they were. Got back home. I was like, guys, we have to try this. This is great. Better than anything we've ever done before. And so like, I ran them through the beginner's box and everything. And it was a lot of fun. And kept playing it for years. Did my own homebrew stuff until eventually I thought to myself, why don't I start pitching this stuff? Because I, I had lots of it written out. And then I got with uh, a different studio, actually, Cobalt Sages Creations. Mm -hmm. Uh, then submitted some stuff to Adam here at DDS. That was almost three years ago now. Um, and I've been writing here for a while now. Started my own publication studio recently. So that's been fun. Mm. Uh, I just recently reconnected. As in, I was knocked off the internet. Ah, mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. Had noticed. Welcome back. Okay. Uh, so my, my beginning, uh, I went to computer camp, not computer, computer des game design camp, uh, when I was 13, and there they brought in a game of D&D 3rd Edition, and the idea fascinated me. It was like a video game, but better. Well, in some ways. Uh, I remember being a total baby back then, so when I lost, I ended up crying. Uh, but... That still didn't sour me on the idea of the game. When when I just got into the game, actually, it was 4E that was be just beginning to rise. So that was, while I was introduced with 3E, the game that kind of was my first real D&D edition was 4E, the Unholy One, I guess. But we, I've around come, here we call it the ver the edition. I'm not the edition. I'm told I'm not supposed to like. It's uh, it's got, in my opinion, it's got a lot of good things to be taken from it, and a lot of bad things can be taken from it. Yeah. But anyway, uh, from there, I went, I actually, I lived, uh, while I uh, computer camped in the uh, USA, I actually lived in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and finding anybody to actually play the game there was very difficult. And even if I did find anybody to there, play there to play, they were all depressed and ha unhappy, so it wasn't really a fun experience. Mm -hmm. So only years later would I actually be able to find a gaming group, and the first gaming group I'd get to play with was a game of Ma Vampire the Masquerade. Through ridiculous circumstances, and that's where I met my gaming group that I've known ever since for like ten years, well, no, six years now. Um... So yeah, uh, I ended up um, a couple uh, while while on my own. I was playing in you know a game of. Uh, I finally managed decided to uh, finally managed to make a game that I would be playing for a really long time, and the game was Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. But I realized there was lots of things that just kept bugging me in it, and I kept searching for alternatives to the system, alternatives to the core magic system, fundamentally, really. And I ended up exploring a lot of them, and then I saw a Kickstarter happening that seemed to be for a system that seemed to fix a lot of the things that were a lot more thematic. Casting and everything, and it was Spheres of Power. I became a fan and um, supported the Patreon, up until eventually um, the uh, Tech Sphere was, really, was in playtest, and I was... I didn't like how it was going, so I ended up suggesting for the author how to rewrite a lot of a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And I and I kind of because I re, 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 like adjusted so much, I kind of became a second author to the book. And that was my first real contribution, uh, the text sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, well, parts of it. And uh, th since then, I also wrote a bunch of smaller apocrypha. And now I guess I'm here. I've completing working on the tinker sphere well the tinker sphere and ultimate engineering which is kind of like a revision of my first work mm -hmm. okay yeah now since since we since we're going in since we're going into both um books tonight i'd like i um 
I'd like to first open with um, Spheres of Guile, which it which is described as the final spoke of the Spheres Triad for for um, Pathfinder. Hmm. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Oh, that that's what's ri- that's what's written right on, right on the page. So <laughs> it was the quickest way to explain to people what we were doing. I felt. Now, yeah, I think it sums it up pretty nice. Now, yeah. um, was this was a concept like Spheres of Guile something that was in the back burner very early on when um when all, going all the way back to Spheres of Power or were or were its inspirations and its um origins a bit more recent? Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Adam. From what I heard from Enjolly, this was kind of started with a lot of stuff that was put on the back burner during Spheres of Might development, right? Sort of, yeah. Um, after we did Spheres of Might and we knew that that was something that we could do, it felt like the natural progression was, well, if we've spherify, sphere, spherified <laughs> magic and we've spherified martial combat, what else is there? And is it some... It seemed like a natural progression. Is this something that we could do? Um Especially with the, um, I'm not even sure what else to say. It was Amber Underwood, I think, that originally pitched the idea. Yeah. And it's just kind of spherifying the other parts of the game. If, if we've already modularified two of the major things, this is kind of all that was left. And we wanted to well, have there's, fun with it. There's also modular races, which, but I sort of took care of that with Spheres of Origin, which is my other project right now. Yeah. Although I, I can I can see why why um why this was referred to as a tri- as a triad, and if we mm-hmm. want if we want to get really pedantic with the amount of stuff you guys have put out for the spheres system, calling it a calling it a triad at this point would be calling it a calling it a strict triad in that se- in that sense or a quartet mm-hmm. or a quintet or what have you, would um be going very off the rails. Or, or if, or if you prefer, go, or if you prefer, um, going down, da- going down the rabbit hole and not coming out, you know, like mm-hmm. a, you know, like playing a game of Factorio. Valid. I know, <laughs> but it's more a case of, um, it's the third conceptual niche. Mm-hmm. Like, there's been a lot of material for both the t- previous two pillars, but we could say that in terms of D and D, the pillars are, you know, social exploration and combat and or... magic kind. Fighter Mage Rogue. It's the original triangle, mm-hmm. or the Fire Mage Rogue. Uh, the Mage got some got Mage got spheres. Fighter got spheres. Now it's time for the Rogue to get spheres. Given that, would you say that um, Spheres of Gal is is meant to accommodate um, all the Skill Monkey archetype? Yes and no. The problem is, is that we didn't know where we were going when we started. If we had known. Ahead of time, we would do this. Then there's certain parts of Spheres of Might that probably would have become Spheres of Guile components. We kind of hit for Spheres of Might. We tried to hit uh, roguelike utility uh, as well as fighter-type characters and stuff. Mm-hmm. So Spheres of Guile does play into the skill monkey, the utility, the party face, the intrigue play, and stuff like that. Uh, though it's not like we haven't done things for roguish people before. This is just taking the rest of it. The things that we couldn't fit in Spheres of Might and giving them their fair time in the Sphere's Sunlight. All yeah. Right. Um, something interesting is that the leadership sphere um, was actually originally going to be part of Spheres of Guile. But um, for reasons that I'm not entirely privy to, the author decided to push it ahead and... Make it a spheres of guile, a, a spheres of combat, not spheres of might system. Mm-hmm. Oh, so get so getting into the nitty gritty of things. Uh, I'll start with this: What are trade traditions, and what sort of fantasy are they meant to fulfill? Um, I can take this one, given that I'm the one who did came up with the concept of trade traditions. Trade traditions are more or less meant to reflect the. Like, like the variety of skills that a character picks up from their background. Mm-hmm. Essentially, like similar to how martial traditions went beyond the whole simple martial exotic triad of weaponry and allowed each character to build up a custom set of proficiencies that deals with their background, culture, or experience. 
trade traditions are intended to do the same thing by allowing people to pick and choose their skill list in such a way as to make a character with a very peculiar set of abilities. So, for example, if I wanted my character to be a gutter snipe who gets uh, who gets around by being sneaky, being cunning, and being a little bit rough, um, then you could select trade traditions to grab skills that you feel are appropriate for that. Sense motive, stealth, knowledge local, acrobatics, um, intimidate, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Or... Similarly, if you want to do something more esoteric, like you are like an archaeologist who studies ancient ruins, you can like select a series of traditions that, or rather a series of like talents that give you like knowledge dungeoneering, spellcraft, knowledge arcana, knowledge history, maybe swim as class skills to reflect that as your play style. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, I feel like. What we tried to do was make every single part of the game modular so you can craft it with loving care to be exactly what you want. But we know that is incredibly pedantic, and very few people actually want that level of granality. So we've done traditions for all three of our systems to just give you simultaneously all sorts of control, but in a package that you don't have to get in there if you and spend an hour crafting it if you don't want to. I mean, you can if you want to, but <laughs> well, if some if somebody wants to, they can go full, they can go full free form, but not everybody not everybody wants to fall, not everybody wants to go into the archetype of what I've come to call swim damn it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think the important thing about traditions is that given the ease of creating a custom tradition versus using a pre-built one, it really allows for people to, you know, just stick with what's pre-made and what's there if they want to get done with their character creation and get it out the door. Mm -hmm. uh, but for those that want to put on those extra little bits and bobs, those finishing touches, they can really get it nice and customized for them uh, in a way that works for a larger group of people and mm -hmm. maintains some semblance of balance. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I am familiar with the concept of skill challenges. I think a lot of people mm -hmm. are by this point. Like, three of us mentioned 4E in our backstories. We yeah. are familiar with the concept of skill challenges. Yeah, and I, um, if you, if you go back and look at my archive, I did a, I did an episode of my podcast where we ranked all of the D&D, &D, ranked all of the, um, 4th edition classes. Spoiler warning, most of the Essentials classes ended up getting at the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. Oh. So in terms of power ranking or something? A combination of of pow of power ranking and how well it fulfills the class fantasy, uh -huh. or if or if it's a case of good, but other, but other people do that archetype better. Uh -huh. Um, but puzzle challenges is something that for a lot of people would be kind of new. Trying to do puzzles in um, tabletop RPGs is always a tricky affair. Yeah. So I'm curious what um, puzzle challenges would entail in this particular case. Let me get that particular document up. Maybe it can offer more detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as I stand to remember it, uh, puzzle challenges have really been David's baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, yeah. for clarity's sake, uh, David and Ross is our kind of project lead here underneath Adam. Mm -hmm. First, yep. Guile specifically, and to be uh, to be wonderfully confusing, David Spectrov is actually my name. <laughs> yeah. So, do they call you David One and David Two? No, it's David. Uh, it's David Alpha and David Omega. Yeah. Usually, oh. I just call them Ross and Spectrov. But looking through the rules for skill challenges again, I feel like. What David tried to do with this is something a bit more dynamic than you would see in the 4E skill challenges or the um, or the rituals in Pathfinder. Mm -hmm. yeah, Essentially, what it what he tried to do with this is provide a a method of creating like multi layered and non linear challenges which um, allow people to gain certain bonuses or penalties depending on how they succeed on, like, various checks, such as 
a stealth check to hide or a perception check to gather information. The idea is that multiple people would be working together in their each oh, um, in their each different area, mm-hmm. and like the they would have positive or negative effects sometimes both on each other that would effectively allow them to navigate it as a party even when they are somewhat separate. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like uh, Ocean's Eleven, where like they're each doing their part in a larger scheme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. oh. Go ahead. As I say, I think one of the very important things about puzzle challenges is that they allow for a level of granularity to your success or fail. Because as it stands in the base Pathfinder role-playing game right now, a skill check is usually very binary. Either you pass it or you don't. You get an effect if you pass, you get a different effect if you don't. Whereas if you look at something like you know, like combat, for example, combat isn't I win it or I don't win it. it there's lots of degrees of resource expenditure. Um, you know, you can come out of combat with you know easy peasy. You rocked it. Mm-hmm. Nothing really happened to you. You spend a little bit, or you know, maybe you came out and you're on your last legs. Three people are on the ground, and you've burnt through like three quarters of your daily resources. Mm-hmm. So to provide more of a granularity to that, rather than just one roll over and done. Mm-hmm. Now, with that, with that, with that in mind. Um, one thing, one thing that Spheres of Guile is, cer- is certainly covering that ten- that tends to get o- tends to get um, overlooked in a lot of ge- in a lot of games. I'd say if there's any D twenty game that's cornered the market on this up until this point, it was um, Fantasy Craft and Spycraft, and that is downtime activity. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious what you guys are adding to the sandbox with that. Uh, this was also my write up, so. The big thing that I did with downtime activity was I took some of the elements that were introduced in Ultimate Equipment and I actually provided better guidelines for, okay, if you are a GM, this is how you can and should integrate it into your game. This should how you, this is how you should plan around character downtime. This is how you can introduce downtime without breaking up the pace. This is how you can essentially create a sense of passage of time or allow for the development of character actions over time without bogging down the game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And similarly, this is how you can stop players from essentially just waiting out the adventure and accumulating copious amounts of money in order to trivialize whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that in mind, I'd like to go into the base classes. Now, obviously, we can't. Obviously, going into the ba- obviously going into the level by level benefits of the base classes would be rather pointless at the, at this juncture. But I'd like to and I'd like to instead go for go for a feel for what it, for what each of these base classes is meant to lean towards. Mm-hmm. And I'll start with the envoy. Someone else want to take this? I didn't have much of a part in that one. I think that was a lot on Brad. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, so I guess the envoy, the best way to describe it from everything I've heard from Brad and the bits of skimming I've done on it is that it's really what is supposed to be our titular face class or not titular but you know the the face class right where like you know bards and rogues and every this that guy and the other all have stuff that goes towards being a face the envoy is designed face first everything else second um and to that effect it has lots of kind of emotion and wit based effects mm-hmm. to help it kind of fill that role as a face who does things with their social skills now that brings me to the ne- the next one on the list, which is the courser. Um, is that supposed to be written as carouser, or is that, or is it written properly um, as courser? It is supposed to be courser. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, although there was a little bit of a pun where, um, uh, where it may have been a joke on the word corsair, meaning pirate, because I think 
at some point, Brad and I were talking about a sort of pirate class um, that some of the ideas eventually metamorphized into the Corsair or Corsair. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, I think it would feel like a transitionary period of like, oh, it's kind of like a ship's cook type deal thing. Uh, but that's definitely not where the class is nowadays. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it's very much kind of, I would describe it as like a mountain man type. Um, mm -hmm. With some similarities to like Ranger with like uh, environmental based effects. Although It's the Bear Gorillas class. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of describing what, it. That, that, can that can certainly work. We... The envoy is definitely is the diplomancer, so it, so it's only fair to use that analogy. Um, mm -hmm. The next is the professional. Oh boy, the professional is very much the. It's a com. Um, it's best described as a combination of the conscript and the expert. Mm -hmm. It is essentially um, a. In essence, I need to stop using that. A class that is a expert, except it's given a whole bunch of class features that actually make it viable and is highly customizable akin to the conscript or in cancer. All right. Um, it does have a lot of abilities that are tied into each specific sphere, but similar to those two classes, it poaches quite a few tools from the rogue, the alchemist, the swashbuckler, the investigator, the cavalier, um, other classes like those, which are built around being very skillful mm -hmm. yeah like yeah you know in spheres of power we have the encanter and spheres of power we have the conscript where their whole deal is i get a bunch of talents and i can optionally crib stuff from other classes and that is all that they are and that's kind of what professional is aiming to be but for you know spheres of guile instead mm -hmm. of spheres mm -hmm. of might spheres of power yeah. so i heard you i heard you like spheres so i put some spheres in your spheres so you can talent while you talent mm -hmm. oh in a manner there of speaking. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, next on the list is the Mastermind. Oh, I had a lot of fun with that one. <laughs> um, I Okay, I didn't write the Mastermind itself, but I was responsible for most of the archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that class is all about... Um, it's the guy in the chair class. It is the one the who just is... just as planned guy. Or, yes. Or the, the... Yeah, the one who um, is capable of playing the smarmy, um, like, m mysterious plotter, and who has a lot of gimmicks based on not only, like, coordinating allies for ridiculous setups, but also being a little bit smarter than the player themselves by being able to set up retroactive plans. Um... A big part of their gimmick is um, sort of that I did it 25 minutes ago type of shenanigans where um, at any time you can declare, like, I have these specific resources or I did this specific thing in order to set things up, um, manipulating from the shadows. Mm -hmm. It's a very fun class to play, and I envision that players are going to have... They're going to come up with a lot of interesting uses for the class's various abilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've actually been very interested in potentially using a mastermind to emulate um, kind of Lelouch from Code Geass of the whole I had eight different layers of plans to get this all done beforehand. Yeah, I yeah, like I remember that when I was writing the um, Bellcaster mastermind archetype um, I jokingly made Seto Kaiba as the character <laughs> and a big part of his gimmick was just like pull it, like saying like I'm rich. So I was able to buy like whatever ridiculous contingency plan that I came up with. Um, it very much, it very much sounds like this would be the ideal archetype for that old, um, for that old, tra that old trap mate, that old, um, um, trap maker mate, um, uh, mage slash rogue that I had, that I had a while back that, pr that created mm -hmm. the up button. Hmm. I've you could prob mm -hmm. you could definitely make that work. I've told the story before, but the up button is a is it was a rune trap I did during my AD and D days. Place the thing on the ground when somebody en when somebody enters the square that that thing is on, they go up. I either treated as if they cast fly on themselves straight upward for six seconds, mm -hmm. at about forty miles an hour. Oh no! 
I think Scrooge McDuck fought one of those once upon a time. <laughs> so, you'd be you'd be amazed how many ideas I I in my early days I stole from Tom and Jerry and Looney Tunes when it came to making traps. That was the sole reason I made the archetype to begin with. Because mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't want to backstab and and pick lock picks. I wanted to create ridiculously elaborate traps for the enemies to fall in. I wanted <laughs> them I wanted them to fall into the to things like the false floor or or um or have a or co or concoct a spell called summon an called summon anvil <laughs> which do, which or summon piano which does exactly what you would think it would do yeah um but the that last reminds me I we do not yet have a talent for retroactively having applied traps to a room but I am writing that down right now <laughs> uh, just think... doing just doing my job um but the last class on the list is the agent, and mm. I'm, I can easily see, when I hear when I hear a term like that, I can easily see an agent being a, being a um, face man. So, the question that I'd have for the agent is for for that is, what class fantasy is it meant to, is it meant to fulfill, and how would it differentiate itself from the envoy? Because I could see people, um, looking at the two like a Venn diagram. So where the envoy is going to talk his way into your vault, mm -hmm. um, Ocean's Eleven style in a lot of ways, the agent is more Mission impossible in their way in. If that, mm -hmm. I can I can get that. Incid yeah. Incidentally, I think I think both I think both of you if if you need some re if you need some um, research material for this kind of thing, look up an anime called Great Pretender. Oh, I've yeah. heard of that one. I haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. The best way that I would describe the agent is it's essentially Agent 47 from the Hitman games. Mm -hmm. It's all about... Um, it's essentially taking like some of the concepts from like the 3.5 and Pathfinder's Assassin class and actually making it work. You like skulk in the shadows. You sneak in to deliver one absolutely devastating hit. And then you like duck out as soon as possible, while trying to cover your tracks. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the Guile spheres, a lot of them are are the are um largely self are largely self explanatory. But there's two that I feel I feel could do I feel could do with a little more explanation in terms of what they bring to the table. Um, and that actually, the more I think about it, three. The first one is body control. Um, so, body control was, I believe, done by Shivan, right? Come on, yeah. Um, and it was supposed to be kind of like I mean, it's hard. It's a hard archetype to describe, but like when you see it, it makes a lot of sense. Like, um, I guess like the traditional like monk stuff of like you know holding your breath for you know, an untold amount of time or putting your body in basically stasis type stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there's I more to a, it than that. I had a different interpretation when I looked through it. My thought goes to a lot of those like contortionists or acrobats or like Las Vegas magicians who like do like ridiculous handcuff escapes and Houdini style, like work my way out of a straitjacket jacket um, type of shenanigans. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's definitely another vibe you can get from it for sure mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, a lot of spheres kind of offer multiple different interpretations and in way they do in areas that they can do things mm -hmm. now the uh, the other one and i i have my guesses as to how it could work but i'd like i'd like a little bit i'd like to nail it down that being um, faction. Oh, this was a fun one to write. Um, even though I didn't write all of it, um, <laughs> faction is all about um, not really resources that you as you you have on your character, mm -hmm. but more it's more about like the connections and the influence that you've accrued within society. The faction sphere is essentially access to the resources and tools of some sort of organization that you are chummy with and all of the ability, m many of the abilities revol revolve around. I know a guy who can do something for us or 
I have some sort of secret way in or secret communications network, which has permitted me to accomplish this in a bit of a roundabout way. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no. good. Oh, go on. No, I, I, you go, you go first. Okay. So, uh, notably, something's faction interacts with that I think is interesting is it does tie in a little bit to, um, if you're familiar with the favors system from Ultimate Intrigue or the mm-hmm. um, prestige point system that PFS used that really came out, I believe, in Ultimate Campaign. Or it might have come for PFS first. I forget the exact order with those. Um, but it, allow- it allows some additional interactions with those subsystems. Not required for the sphere of function, but just stuff that is there. Mm-hmm. Since it's kind of the same niche. Yeah. Now, with that... In- with that in mind, the third one that I, w- that I was curious about is spell hacking. Especially since just the term hacking alone pr- provides its own connotations. I think so. If that one, if correct me if I'm wrong, but that's the use magic device sphere, right? Yep. Effectively, yeah. I think in that, so from what I understand, it's just having a lot more fun with that uh, in classic Pathfinder rogues disarm magical traps it's like well what can we do with magic beyond being a spellcaster and having a lot of fun with that Mm -hmm. i have notes for a whole class built around that sphere (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i I could i could certain i could certainly see that um and um, and I'd also i'd also seen that there's that there's going to be some degree of cross compatibility with the with the other spheres and of, and of course with more traditional um, classes. Um, yeah, interaction with traditional classes, I believe, is something we really had planned from the start because we yeah. don't want to alienate that entire like realm of design that exists oh, boy. and has existed mm-hmm. for over I a decade. Remember, now. Yeah, I remember like many times when we were working on things, David routinely stressed we have to make this work we don't we, we have to make it so that you don't need spheres of power or spheres of might in order to make this function this should be accessible to like everyone who plays pathfinder not just those of us who have been doing spheres for years mm-hmm. and, yeah, and i mean i have some personal disagreements with that take but i do understand where he was coming from with it and the i the base idea itself isn't bad at all mm-hmm. um because making this accessible and able to stand on its own is important as both the other systems are able to stand on their own as well mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, regarding actually interaction though with the other two subsystems we very recently hit our stretch goal to include content mixing all of these options now because yeah. originally we weren't going to send that out with um, the whole series of guide book mm-hmm. yeah now just as a heads up, I am going to have to pull out here soon. Do you have any like last questions for me? Because everyone seems to pretty much have it. I've yeah. done a lot to contribute I, um, so far. I can't. I think. I think. I think we'll be more. I think we'll be more or less cut. More or less covered. Um, I'm go. The plan. The plan that I have. The plan that I have next is to shift into, um, ultimate engineering. So hope. So um. I'm. I'm, hoping that that Scowling has his um will have his mic unmuted. Oh. Are you there, Scowling? Did did somebody call my name? Yeah, me. <laughs> oh, apolo- apologies. I uh, I was distracted by a dog. My dog. No, no worries. Oh. Thank you for clarifying. Mm-hmm. But, but no, I don't. But I'm not. Gonna, I won't keep. I won't keep you any further than you, than you need to, Adam. Thank, thanks for stop. Thanks for um coming. Thanks for coming back, and I hope Thank to you. see you again. So stay frosty, man. You too. Mm-hmm. See you all later. Yep. Now, continuing into ultimate engineering. Uh huh. Um, as I, uh, since I since I asked about how spheres of how um spheres of guile started out, I I naturally have to ask how um ultimate engineering um came came to be since. A lot of it, a lot of it is built is built around the tech sphere. But was it a case of starting out as a revamp text, a revamp of the tech sphere, and then it expanded into something bigger, or was there a different route? Well, uh, remember, I kind of, uh, I kind of partly inherited the tech sphere. 
from another author and all the top of that because the tech sphere was initially designed to give away to get the you those um piezo tech options in like a in a way that doesn't require you to spend a ton of money um so when i made the second book for that i was going more completely direction of trying to make it a primary system for technology in your game but it became increasingly clunky, and on top of that, both for beca both because in part it was cl uh, clinging from Paizo's design, and on top of that because I was less experienced, I began to notice increasingly more flaws with it as I was trying to you know continue it into the third book. I was beginning to see, oh wait a minute, no, there's a ton of bloat. Every care like in order to get anything cool, you need to invest so much talent into it. Well, how about if I give people ways to get a ton of talents into this at the same time? I'm like, oh wait, no, damn it, that's a ton of work, and that's a ton of work. And then I realized it's just becoming so bloated to work on this. But I still thought the idea of like a technology-based system was something really neat. And I think that's something, you know, people could really enjoy for different reasons. And so I said, okay, how about I, you know, I start from the beginning and try to work this out from the bottom. And then I reworked it. And then I reworked it again. And then I reworked it a third time. And then I reworked it again. And then I decided, you know, like... Um, I, there's like five different drafts of this freaking thing on the background. Me just working with power, like, you know, like resource management, how to package this stuff together, what sort of effects it can and can't do, you know, working on the experience that I've developed over the years as both playing this game, playing with tech, and being a game master of my own game as well. And so while it does have connections to the tech sphere, it's intentionally called the Tinker Sphere for two reasons. First of all, it's so there's no mechanical overlap with any sort of effects. And on top of that, it's intentionally more idea neutral. When you think of tech, you think of like robots and cyborg limbs and stuff like that. But Tinker, it's like, well, it can be robotic parts, but it could also be, you know, artifice, or it could also be just someone tinkering with clockwork or steam or it's intentionally a lot more neutral in its idea uh, you know and its ideas mm -hmm. so it's it's very it's got some things you could say oh i remember that from the tech sphere but it's very much its own animal but very much intentionally all right because uh, there's a lot of things that i think really benefit from improvement being the second time around in a way yeah, and I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing there will be some means in easing people into the, into this new take of the tech sphere. Yes, yes. There's a very large um, thing about explaining the details. There's a glossary. This has been a one man effort on my part. It's not as big as Sears of Guile, but it's still a very big book in terms of the content you have. Yeah. Um. I've got some points I could go over, or you could just ask me some more questions, whatever you'd prefer. Um. Well, when when it came when it came to the when it came to the original um, text sphere, what was the point when you could you go into what the point was when you fi you felt like the design of the the design of the text sphere originally was painting into a corner, for lack of a better term. The most player-oriented direction was I realized that it was the bloat, because every single talent in the tech sphere corresponded to one gizmo, you know, one invention. It wasn't actually called a gizmo, it was called a gadget, but you gave you one type of gadget. Uh, mm -hmm. Rarely it give, gave a couple, rarely, but it generally only gave one. And, like, a lot of them weren't really kind of useless by themselves, and needed something else. So you'd be investing into something useless to, again, to gain maybe something else that'd be nice and then would work together. So, like, if you wanted to, like, say, like, a talent, for instance, would just for wires, you'd, you'd just to wire your base up with electricity and maybe, like, signals or whatever. And yeah, that's really cool, but that's, a, that's an investment you have to make and you don't get anything else from that. And on top of that, I realized that the, just the core. I was effectively I was working off of nearly unlimited resources because of the charge mechanic was effectively unlimited. I didn't I didn't really think the, through the consequences of uh, the generators, for instance, that I made. Even though they were legendary, a lot of things I put into like GM optional 
I was leaning too much on that as a crutch. I was leaning too much on, oh, the GM will take care of it. When, when there's so many problems, you know, at this point, the GM could just says, you know, I'm just dropping this whole thing. I don't want to deal with these problems. What do I gain out of this? Mm-hmm. So it, this was a consolidation. It was an expansion at the same time as it was a consolidation. In the tech sphere, every single talent gives you a bunch of stuff. Like, generally designed to not be more powerful than equivalent, like, uh, an equivalent talent generally gives you, like, for instance, in the equipment sphere, gives you one th- effect, but you got that effect online all the time. While the tech sphere might give you some weaker versions of that effect, but a bunch of different ones, and you have to spend a resource on them to make them work. Yeah. And that brings me to the that brings me to the resource you mentioned on the page. It mentions a resource pool called Gizmos. And I'm guessing uh-huh. that, I'm guessing that is the resource that's utilized when you when it comes to interacting with the tech sphere. Yes. Oh, not tech sphere, but the tinker sphere. Yeah. In the tech sphere, there were two different resources. There was the gadget pool, as well as charges. Gadgets were, you know, your abilities, and your, and you spent charges to make your gadgets work. Uh, the tech, the Tinker Sphere combines these two together into a single uh, resource package called Gizmos. Um, it functions similarly to Alchemy Sphere stuff, where it takes 15 minutes to craft, uh, like a couple of them, and they're renewable. They're designed to be renewable, but at the same time, there's customization options for them to be less renewable if you, as a GM, don't want a renewable-based game. Mm-hmm. Um... But the way it works is that, like, um, if you you craft a gizmo, which you know gives you an effect, but you can also craft batteries, and batteries also count towards that pool. So the question is, do you want to have like a lot of um, weaker, you know, f- effects, or do you want to dedicate some of your limited resource pool towards buffing up one of your existing effects? So, for instance, you could have like a a weak attack option just from like a weapon, but then you could also dedicate another gizmo from the gizmo pool to craft a battery. Then you can ex- deplete that battery in order to have that attack deal more damage. Mm-hmm. That's an example. Yeah. Now, given now given that, I think a, I, I think a lot of people when they, when they think of, when they think of this particular concept, one there's a few there's obviously a few genres that that it could be adaptable to. You mentioned steampunk. You mentioned super science. You mentioned magitech. Um, Organic tech or biopunk, gnome tinkering, so on. Um, I'd like to pick your brain a bit, a bit on that. So, how would how um, if if someone wanted to use this for say Magitech, a la they're running an Eberron campaign, um, what sort what sort of tips would you give them to you when it comes to utilizing the Tinker Sphere? Uh, well. The Tinker Sphere comes with its own traditional option, tradition options. Similarly to martial traditions or um, casting traditions, but this comes with tech traditions. Or I think I don't remember if I called them Tinker traditions, but effectively it has a tradition option. But unlike the other options, which are designed around player customization and generally oriented player first, this is more GM oriented mm-hmm. because. A lot of people are a lot more picky about what kind of technology they allow in their game than they are about magic. Magic can be just a weird personal thing, but if your character is running around with lasers in my stone in my Stone Age base campaign, I don't like that. So um, this comes with its customization options. For instance, if you want your technology to be more realistic, you could say your character needs to actually get their resources and pay at least some amount of money for them, hmm. or they could say. I don't like I don't like the idea of this being something like I tried to make this tech feel techy and realistic in the sense not not like in the fantasy in the in the sci-fi sort of sense in like because while you could always just refluff magic to be you know you could always just refluff magic but it always feel a little weird for instance like okay I have this laser gun can you hand this laser gun to your friend no you can't like can I plug in my laser gun to a generator to have it fire more? No, you can't. It's it, There's only... It kind of begins to feel fake. And on top of that, if you're up against magic, it just feels identical. But if you're running an Eberron campaign, you just pick like, a, you know, like you'd pick a tradition for it that fits. I, I also have a bunch of sample traditions. Mm-hmm. And then your players, if you allow them to have, you know, the Tinker Sphere, they would have to function under this. 
So for instance, if you say, okay, in my magic tech thing, th your stuff is dispellable like um, just as dispellable, dispellable as magic because it functions under magical rules. You know, it's got some magical materials powering it. You apply that and it works like that. And similarly, of course, other traditions, if you want to have a custom one, sure. If you want to make a technology-based setting where you use undead corpses uh, powered to power like hamster wheels or something, or like power your computers by having hundreds and hundreds of stupid undead working together in binary, mm. it can be like that. Um, to put another spin on that, since a lot of my audience could be described as filthy weebs and f and f and heretics for bringing in video game aspects into tabletop, at least that's what I get told by grogs every week. Um, how how would what's how would you handle this sort of tradition thing when it comes to say? Materia from Final Fantasy VII. Uh, now this is where I'll have to uh, bow down my head and turn around in shame, where I'll admit I'm not super familiar with Final Fantasy VII. Uh, uh, <laughs> he said it, not be me. Re be ready for the death threats, my guy. I am yeah. more familiar. Uh, I'm more familiar, like I've you know I've seen recaps and playthroughs of a lot of them, but not Final Fantasy VII actually. Uh, but from what I remember, from what I, I kind of get a vague sense of, is that Materia was actually more magical and everything else was more technological. Well, that it was, or am I wrong? Or is that? Well, the the big th the big thing that I want I wanted to go with is that with Materia you have you have these you mechanically speaking, narrat narratively speaking, is a whole other matter. But me but when it comes to mechanics, you have to in order to achieve uh, magical effects, you have to affix them onto um, we onto weapons and armor. Oh. Well, actually, in this... Uh, the, because the Tinker Sphere is very big for a sphere, it works using the Sears of Might system. It's not a separate system. It mm -hmm. works off an existing one. Uh, it's actually split into five sub-packages, similarly to how Nature Sphere is in Spheres of, uh, spheres of Power. Mm -hmm. And here are the five packages. Augmentation, which deals with uh, you know increasing creatures... Cyborg limbs, you know, buffing creatures directly, mm -hmm. things like that. We have uh, computation, which deals with, you know, robotics, AI, th that sort of thing. We have um, v uh, transportation, which deals with, you know, vehicles. But on top of that, you can use it to also build mechs or autonomous drones or, mm -hmm. you know, just robots. Uh, there is transmission, which deals with you know radio signals and stuff like that. You know, detecting information, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, augmentation, computation, sig, uh, transmission, transportation, and then lastly, there is modification, which deals with modifying equipment. Mm -hmm. So, if you wanted to say just have cust the thing is this: this is so customizable, you could just run it as a straight up magic system. Mm -hmm. So if you just want to say, okay, you customize your weapons with like custom elemental effects or things like that, yes, it's actually really easily available to do within the system. Mm -hmm. And also, let me quickly mention, the reason why I split them off into those five packages, outside of also making it easier to learn, is that it's for the GM's benefit. If the GM says, well, I, I'm, I like a setting where you've got like steampunk robots, but you know, using like radios, that just doesn't feel right to me. So you can just say, okay, well, the robot you know thing is in game. You can use the transportation package, but I'm disallowing the transmission package. Mm -hmm. And so, bing, bam, boom, you've customized it to fit your campaign. Mm -hmm. I I put a lot, a lot of thought into not just making it fun for the players, but also manageable for the GM. Mm -hmm. And I'd say um, a big focus was giving the GM a bunch of tools to counter player tools in a way, if you want to use it that way. Mm -hmm. the, the ultimate pl counter to player tools is no, I said no because I'm the GM. They've got some something that prevents you from burrowing there because I said so. Mm -hmm. And you can always do that, but this has a little bit more organicness to it. Mm -hmm. For instance, like if you have players that just burrow through walls, this has a thing in here, for instance, where you can put up a sensor that'll detect damage done to walls. Mm -hmm. So the players might, for instance, want to like shut it down, or maybe send somebody in to you know break the generator, so that way it can't power that. 
So then they can burrow in. Mm-hmm. So like it's got, or you know maybe they just burrow in and alert the security. You know it's got some more back and forth, and it's very much designed with GM customization in mind. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd like to di- I, there's before I dip into the uh, inventor. There's one other thing I wanted to go into with the Tinker Sphere. You mm-hmm. mentioned the possibility of building mechs with this sphere. Yes. And with some with something like that, I'm curious if if a if mechs would be treated as as equipment or if it's something that potentially might need its own character sheet. Um. So yeah, I spent a, a bit, vehicles were the thing I had to spend quite a long time with because vehicles have never done super well in Pathfinder. Yeah. As speaking as someone who tried to make vehicles work, there were complications. Mm-hmm. So, um, the, the way I made this work is I just went an easy way. Vehicles are just effectively creatures. Uh, they're creatures that lack actions unless you invest your actions into them. And another thing is that, um, like, the thing I, I added is that in case you ride inside a, a vehicle, its cockpit separately destroyable from the creature itself. So that's like just two simple little mechanics that I felt just emulated piloting a vehicle pretty well. So, for instance, uh, you know, if you're riding a tank, you know, you can either just try to blow up the tank itself, or you can try to make a hole in itself and then just shoot the pilot inside. If just there's just a, a weak gnome inside, you can just you know rip the thing apart. Mm-hmm. And of course, if there's a weak gnome piling in it, the thing will not be as effective as if piloted by a powerful character. But yeah, they're they're treated as independent creatures that have you have to give your actions to, and they benefit from your abilities. It works a bit similarly to the technician independent invention type deals, but a little bit more refined. Also, a little more like calculated in a lot of spots. For instance, uh, you can't like as I said. For instance, the independent invention could just have full cover, and then. If your inventor isn't there, that's just a whole bunch of extra hit points that's impossible to get to him until you destroy the thing. But this now with the cockpit rules, you can destroy the cockpit and get to him. But at the same time, you, or you could you know invest into an upgraded cockpit, so it's not just nothing. So it's not so it's no no defenses. It's still some defenses. Mm-hmm. Or you could um, you know try to pick lock, lock pick the cockpit lock open, or stuff like that. It, it, I try to make it dynamic. Mm-hmm. Now. That, of course, brings me to the Inventor class. And uh-huh. what I'd, obviously what I'd, be, what I'd be curious about is how the, is, um, is what sort of class fantasy, bes- besides the obvious part of the name, that's going co- to be covering? Uh, well, uh, well, I guess it's a bit self-explanatory. It's the... Has anybody here uh, read... Well... You could take it on multiple different options depending. It's like um, you could. Well, yeah, I guess it's self-explanatory in the sense you're playing an inventor tinkerer type character, or like the technician, similar to that. You know, the mm-hmm. person who like you know improvises a mecha, or you depending on which packages you specialize in. So I'll I'll go into a little bit of the invent. It's a bit dif- difficult to understand until you realize what's it about. Mm-hmm. It's an alternative technician. What? How did the technician work? Uh, you got to make inventions, and you got to make those inventions better by picking up talents that grant you access, like, for instance, give you the ability to make steampunk tech or electro tech. But this is an example of something that, like, what I meant is that it do- might not feel organic in your setting. What if in your setting you don't want there to be electricity? Well, then, like... You have to refluff it, but then there's some weirdness. Then why does it take more damage from electricity? You know, I intentionally made this more system neutral. And instead of basing around getting more abilities depending on, like, the the theme of the technology, you get more of depending on the package. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, a inventor that specializes in transmission will be a very, like, there's different archetypes. The archetypes the inventor could be depend on the package archetypes. If you're going augmentation, you're cyborg man. Or uh, with a different, with using an exosuit version, you could be wearing like Iron Man suit, mm-hmm. like uh, to amplify your abilities. Uh, if you're going modification focused, you're gum- you're somebody with like an awesome custom gun, and you're busting out like swords, and you've got an awesome, you know, armor and stuff like that. 
Mm -hmm. If you're going computation focused, you're making yourself AI. Uh, I'm there's still some trepidation about if I'm going to add this fully or not, but you'd be hacking things again. This would be contextually de de depends on if you're going to run have a lot of tech in your setting. Having a hacker is not just not important if you don't have a lot of tech. Mm -hmm. But you'd still make AI. You'd make like things that like you know process information for you, lie detectors, things like that. Mm -hmm. If you're going for um, you know, vehicles, obviously, you can be a vehicle pilot or have a robot buddy. Uh, and if you're going transmission, you're like, you know, sensor guy, you're communications expert. Mm -hmm. And you know, for instance, in baseline D&D, &D, it's surprisingly difficult to just get some, like a radio to talk with somebody else like across a dungeon because the transmission immediately begins to break down. Mm -hmm. This has some counterplay where you can set up like inter intermediary talking points. Or you could use your information to scan for bad guys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, like, technology has a lot of different archetypes to it. So there's a lot of different archetypes the inventor could be depending on what you specialize in. And of course, you could just choose not to specialize in things and just do a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind... Since since you dip, you dipped into those those few examples when it came to Mac possibility, but um, when you brought when you brought up the like with like with going power armor a la Iron Man, but what if somebody wants to go full on full on Mecha a la um, let's let's use an example I've been I've been tinkering around with for the last few months um BattleTech, uh -huh. just some just something like say something like say a Scout Mech or even an Urban Mech, uh -huh. um. As our as our hypothetical uh -huh. example in this case, vehicle package. It's all covered in the vehicle package, mm -hmm. from missile launchers, flamethrowers, stuff like that. You know, as like yeah, it's all covered in the vehicle package. Mm -hmm. And I've tried to make it cover as much like technologically neat ideas as possible. Yes, anime included, anime stuff included, though I've made the references a little more subtle in this one. Uh, and you should be able to, you know, as I said, make Scout Max if you want to. You can. Uh, you could. Okay, I'm stuttering. Next question. <laughs> so, what do you get? What do you guys. Sh I know that this is. I know this may end up changing because of stretch goals, but. What are you guys shooting for as far as a page count hmm. for um, Spheres of Guile and for Ultimate Engineering? I think Spheres of Guile is going to be something like two, my my like eyeballing it is going to be about two hundred pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, the thing about Spheres of Guile's development is it's been very compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. Um. So the only person who I think would really be able to answer that would be either Adam or David. Mm -hmm. Sadly. Yeah. I mean, we have everything consolidated in a single folder at this point. I just haven't taken a lot of time to review everything that's outside of my wheelhouse. I've mm -hmm. I've been working on subsystems. I've been working on a few specific spheres. I've been working on archetypes. Um. There are that still leaves a lot that I have not really touched. Mm -hmm. Given how much flux everything was in for a very long time with this project, as well as just like how long it's been going, I didn't really want to touch most stuff till it was like in a very finished state. So I was kind of waiting on playtests to actually get into a lot of other people's stuff. But there's a lot of considerations that we don't know right now, like how much word count's going to change post playtest because we plan on playtesting everything. Mm -hmm. um, and getting a lot of changes there to make sure everything is in like tip top shape. Uh, so there's a lot of wording that could change there, and given the size of what we have, that could easily be affecting like page count plus or minus like I would say like 20 pages if, mm -hmm. if a lot of stuff gets changed in word like lengthy ways or gets cut. Yeah. Um, and then I have no idea how much art we're commissioning, um, what type of layout style we're going for exactly. Uh, all these things are going to play into our final page yeah. count in a way that's hard to predict at this current moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that with Spheres of Guile, we've commissioned at least five pieces of art. Um, and the Iconics, right? Yeah, the Iconics and the cover. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. All right. But, I mean, DDS has a huge art library available of things to use, mm -hmm. not counting, you know, stock art and 
bespoke commissioned pieces that may come in later. Mm-hmm. And what are you guys shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date, but a general window. I think... I'd say... Like, don't quote me on this, because I'm not the expert on it, but I feel like um, our estimate is something like early summer of 2022. Yeah, maybe even, like, in theory, late spring, but also in theory, like, late summer. Because it all depends on how long we end up taking to playtest once... I believe we don't plan on playtesting until the Kickstarter is done. We've kind of been... There's been back and forth on whether or not to do it before or after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the text, the Tinker Sphere is currently in play tests on a, the Discord. Uh, and for how long it is, I don't know, really know how to eyeball Google document word uh, page count into printed page count. But for comparison, the the Inventor's Handbook 2, the, my previous release, was about 33 pages, and it had about like about 18,000 words. This thing has about 60 plus thousand words. So like, I don't know, I guess it's about 100 pages at this point. Mm -hmm. But that's just a guesstimate. Yeah, I can I can understand that. And with all that with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank all of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Mm hmm. No problem. It was nice. You're welcome. To talk about myself. I mean, I am admittedly quarantined anyway, so. Uh, I'm. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not quarantined, but uh, but it's the middle of winter, so it's not like anybody's going anywhere, anyways. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, There's been stuff going on where I live. But with oh, but um, and ain't and anytime you guys see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. Yep. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Have a happy holiday, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Alright, then. Don't drink the eggnog. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>